the 1960s, a Washington man experienced easily the worst weekend of his entire life. It traumatized him, his family, destroyed his house beyond repair. But the reason for all this chaos and destruction is something that's going to disturb you once you find out. You won't want to miss this one. In the 1960s, John, who was a timber foreman in Washington state, arrived home like any other Friday evening. He was then greeted immediately by his four-year-old son, Timothy. Now that he was home from a long day of work, he would explain to his father that they had an unexpected visitor that day. Now, John was immediately off-put by what his son had told him because his son kept referring to this man as the cow man. Now, John simply thought his son Timothy was just confused and that he actually meant cowboy. And so he's asking his son, did you mean a cowboy, you know, like when they wear a big hat? And his son, who's four years old, just kept telling him, no, daddy, he's the cow man because he's furry and he stinks like a cow. Now, John paused for a moment and just thought to himself, all right, my son's four. You know, he probably just saw a large black bear on the property. I mean, which isn't exactly uncommon because this is Washington state after all. And so he just kind of calmly gets up and, you know, goes inside and doesn't think too much of it. And then he goes and starts conversing with his wife. And she tells him that she's unsure of what he meant by the cow man, but describes that something odd happened just a few hours ago. And so Timothy, I guess, had been playing on the porch all afternoon, and at some point or another, he begins yelling that the cowman was stuck on the fence. And, you know, he's just going off and off, and, you know, he runs inside, and he's trying to explain to his mom, you gotta come see this, the cowman is stuck on the barbed wire fence. And now she thinks he's just being a four-year-old boy and his imagination is running haywire. And so, you know, she kind of blows him off at first, but he eventually convinces his mother to come outside. And so she steps outside and immediately she's struck by this really rancid odor. It was kind of like garbage and wet dog. And while his mom is struck by this odor, he just keeps on pointing and telling her, he got loose, he got loose, he's over there. And as he's yelling and pointing, Pointing to the opposite field, his mom kind of, you know, comes to after trying to discern where this odor is coming from and what is it. And she begins to follow Timothy's finger and where he's pointing. And she could see that the barbed wire is now swinging up and down just like it would have been if it had been released from very heavy pressure. However, there's no sign of this cowman. The only thing she could think of is that it just must have been a really large black bear. Now, obviously, the mom had no idea what it was that Timothy saw, but she figured, you know what, if there's a large black bear in the area, I better keep my boy inside. And so Timothy had to play inside for the remainder of the day. Now, as John and his wife were conversing and discussing the potential dangers of having a very large black bear on the property and what it could mean for the safety of their children, John's oldest son, who was 12 at the time, John Jr., had just got home from a friend's house and he began telling his parents that on the way home, somebody was following him. And he explained to his dad that he never saw who it was, but that he could hear them because they were staying behind the trees and doing their best to try and conceal their presence from him. And so once John's son had reached the driveway, whoever this person was had stopped following him altogether. And he could tell that his son was pretty shaken up about this because they live in a very rural area. And so for someone to come out here and hide away on their property, I mean, it could really only mean a small handful of things, all of which are very bad. Now, John realizes that he needs to now go scout the property and go take care of business because if there is an intruder, he's obviously not gonna let them hurt his family. So he goes out, he loads up his 357, and now he's beginning to scour the property line and he's looking around for any signs of anybody camping out here or anything like that. And after scouring the area for a while, you know, he doesn't really find much, but actually comes across a really strange discovery. 
the strange tangle of stringy long reddish brown hair that was actually wrapped around the barbed wire. It was the same barbed wire fence that Timothy had pointed out earlier. Now, what was even stranger was just how stinky and thick and jumbled this was. And in fact, it was so thick, he actually had to take out his buck knife to try and cut it off the barbed wire. Now, as he's looking at this clump of hair, he could see there's actually what appears to be a little bit of flesh attached to it. And now he's completely unsure of what to make of it. It's very strange, but in his mind, he's thinking, you know what? I'm right, there's a very large black bear around here. I need to stay very vigilant. Now, immediately, he looks below him and he's looking for any signs that this bear was around or any tracks, but again, he can't find anything. So doing the best he can, he just heads back to the house and he shows his family this strange clump of hair that doesn't exactly look like the kind of hair that belongs from a black bear. The color's not right, it, it smells different. But again, there's really not much he can do about it other than just kind of write it off. So he just tells his kids, listen, just keep your eyes open. Let me know if anything else strange happens and I'll be right at your side. Well, the evening went along without any issues until around eight or so PM. And John had decided that he was going to go patrol his property again and decided that this time he would bring his 12 year old son along with him. And so he's out there and he's armed and he's there with his son and they're kind of just walking along the perimeter when they both run into this wall of stench. And it's exactly like his wife had described. And as soon as they hit this wall of odor, both John and his older son realize they're being watched. And now John going into dad mode is thinking that they're in danger, his son's in danger, and that something bad is about to happen. And so he's starting to really become convinced that there's not a black bear here, but there's actually somebody camping out on this property and they're looking for the right moment to break in and harm his family. Because it was summertime in July, the sun wasn't completely down yet. And so John realized that he really wanted to have daylight on his side if he was to try and face this person head on. And so he turns to his son and explains that they really should get back inside because it's getting dark. Now, John's son is getting pretty freaked out by this. And so they start heading back in the direction of the house. And at this point, they're roughly about halfway back to the house when both John and his son notice that Whoever this person is out there that's camping out on their property is now following them in the foliage off to their left. And John notices a few things that are very wrong with his initial assumptions. The first is that this person sounds much larger than any person he's ever heard. The footfalls alone are extremely heavy. In addition to that, he can only assume their intention was physical harm, considering how much effort this person made to remain concealed. Every couple of steps, this person would follow, and every time they would stop, it would stop. It's almost like an episode of Scooby-Doo. And so John turns to his son and says, listen, on the count of three, I need you to run like hell. And so he counts, one, two, three, but, John had a plan in place. And as soon as he said three, he pushes his son for him to start. And now his son is taking off running through the clearing back in the direction of the house. And instead of John running with him, he whips around with his gun to face the foliage on his left, gun drawn and ready for the worse. And as soon as he does this, he can hear the footfalls heading deeper into the woods away from him. And so at this point, John is gonna pursue this person and make them pay dearly for already inflicting this kind of torment on his family. Now he's gonna go in there, he's gonna march, and he's gonna find out exactly who this is and why they're doing this. But there's a problem. Pursuing this person is gonna to be tough. The underbrush where he's going into is extremely thick, a lot of dense foliage, and he won't be able to move around quickly. And so John just decides to go in after this vagrant. And after only making it a few yards from where he originally entered, he actually starts to see movement by a large tree that's directly ahead of him. Now thinking he just has the perfect checkmate aha moment, he stops, aims his weapon at the tree and begins to shout at this vagrant to come out now, or I swear to God, I'll come back there and shoot you. Now the only response he got was just silence. 
and it made the moment far more tense. And so John began to move closer when something out of the corner of his eye caught his attention. Now on the defensive, he whirls around and he saw this large shape bearing down on him and it was incredibly fast, moving on all fours, flying past him about 15 feet away. And so John's thinking, great, this isn't a vagrant. My wife was right that this is a very large black bear. But that thought would soon change. This huge hairy animal stops right behind a small altar tree and what John saw next shook him to his core and then it made him realize that he was dealing with something that was far beyond what he ever imagined being just a bear. And so he kind of quickly snaps out of his shock and as he realizes this large animal is now heading in the direction of his own house, he quickly kind of comes back to and runs back out of the foliage into the field or the clearing and hopes that he can actually intercept this animal before it ever makes it there in time. And the entire time this is happening, he could just hear this huge animal barreling down into the woods, just knocking over trees and foliage and just stomping around and making a ruckus. It was now noisier than ever. And as John broke out of the tree line into the clearing, he saw that his son, John Jr., had not left, but was actually there waiting for him. And so he's yelling at his son, what are you doing? Why didn't you go back to the house? And his son is just telling him that, dad, I was worried about you. And he's saying, you need to get back to the house now. We're dealing with a large animal that we don't know what it is. And his son is really confused by this. And all of a sudden, this large animal burst through to their left no more than 50 feet away on their left hand side clears a fence and john's son begins to run but has a horrifying realization that his son and this animal are about to collide head on and bam this thing smacks into john's son sending him flying 10 feet in the air landing on the ground the wind knocked out of him he's freaked out this large bear begins just fling back into the other side of the woods as John tries to take aim at this thing and tries to fire. Now, fortunately for John, he does land a few shots on this bear, but it didn't seem to have any effect as it fled off into the woods. Now, as soon as it vanished into the tree line, John runs over to his son and makes sure that his son isn't hurt. Now, obviously he's pretty shaken up. His son, just from the experience and getting knocked 10 feet in the air and realized that the bear on the property is gonna be a lot more of a nuisance than they had ever originally planned. And so John just holds up his son, kind of gets him back to his feet, drags him back to the house, And obviously at this point, his wife and his youngest son, Timothy, are both completely shocked by everything that's happened now. And so John's wife is screaming at him. She's making demands to know what was happening and why there was screaming, why was there gunshots, what is going on? Now she's convinced that John and John Jr. were being attacked by a group of men or maybe a wild animal, they don't know. So John doing his best to try and just, you know, ease the situation, he just began to tell his wife that there's a very large bear outside and that he had everything under control and, you know, it was it was fine. But as a safety precaution, he went and told her to go lock all the doors and windows, and then he goes and grabs the phone, calls the sheriff, and then immediately hangs up. Now, you can only imagine at this point how John and his wife felt about letting their two sons outside after knowing this large bear was lurking around. And so as the night progressed further, it got to about 10 p.m. and John and his wife began hearing this this strange sound coming from outside that they could not identify. Now, John was already pretty familiar with a lot of the flora and fauna and just general wildlife noises in the area, but what he was hearing just didn't make sense. It was this loud, almost sorrowful kind of wailing that was similar to that of a siren of a fire truck. It just had this animalistic quality to it that he couldn't accurately pinpoint but he'd made a disturbing observation about the noise and that it was coming from across the field by their home and then it ended in a series of whooping noises. Now, John's wife was completely terrified by the sound and her eyes are wide and she's freaking out and she's asking her husband, what the hell is that? And this, my friends, is when John decides to spill the beans. He turns to his wife and with the most serious, stern expression, tells her that this is the cowman that Timothy was talking about. 
He told her what he saw in the woods earlier that evening out at that alder tree and explained to her that this clearly was anything but a bear and that it was over seven feet tall and it was enormous and that it was still too dark because they were in the foliage to really make out all the specifics and every feature and detail. He was able to see that this thing had deep red glowing eyes and could see these kind of dark teeth and swore that the lips were curling back and whatever it was, was able to alternate between two and four legs before quickly lurching over and pushing back on a tree with so much force that when it let go, it snapped, crashed into the trees around it. And after hearing this, his wife was obviously terrified. I mean, they realized that the cowman is not only real, but it's something that could be potentially far more dangerous than any black bear. All the more reason why he hung up on the sheriff's department immediately and they were unsure of what to do or how to proceed with anything. Now, as the night continued to progress, the strange siren noises would continue on and off, and finally, at about one in the morning, John, who had been working hard all day, was just completely exhausted. And at this point, the man could barely keep his eyes open, and so he just completely crashes out. Now, the next morning comes, and it's like nothing ever happened. Everything seemed completely fine, and so John and his wife were beginning to think that whatever this animal was was probably just passing through the area and that everything would be okay. But it wasn't until a little later in the morning when John made a terrifying discovery about the previous night. During a commercial break in their Saturday morning cartoons, both the boys began telling their father that a large bear had been rubbing up against the house during the nighttime. As John Jr. began explaining to his father the strange sounds he was hearing that night were actually coming right outside the house, John began to realize that things were about to get far worse for him and his family. And Timothy then would speak up and would say to both his parents, you know, the cow man, he just, he talks funny. And of course, John just froze mid thought and he looked over at his son, Timothy, and began asking him, when did you talk to the cow man? And you know, Timothy being four, not even realizing the danger of the situation, just calmly told his dad, oh, you know, last night in my room. And now John is thinking that this thing is in my son's room and he keeps pressing for more information and he asks his son, was it in your room? And his son is just pretty much like, Dad, no, he's too big for my room. He was talking to me outside my window. And he just kept telling his dad, yeah, he talks funny. And, and he explained to his dad that the cowman kind of talked, you know, like this. Ooh, ha, ha, ooh, ooh. And it kind of sounded like, you know, monkey-like chatter of some kind. Now, for all of you out there watching this, and if you have any kids of your own, you could probably imagine John's level of anxiety at this point, thinking that your precious child is about to get snatched. And so he keeps pressing for more answers as to what this cowman was doing outside his son's window. And he, keep, he keeps asking Timothy questions like, you know, did, you, did he try to get inside the window? What was he doing? And at this time, you know, Timothy was glued to the TV because the commercials had ended. And, you know, he just kept smiling and told his dad that, oh, you know, dad, he's too big. And, you know, he kept making a very interesting comment about his facial expressions and his teeth. And he explained to his father that the cowman had what he would describe as Lincoln long teeth and that he was making funny faces through the window. Now, at this point, John is literally overcome with fear, anxiety, nausea, just about every negative emotion you could possibly muster. And as a father, he's trying to think in his mind, how is he going to keep his family safe? He doesn't know what to do. So after doing a safety check and looking outside the house and just trying to check all the windows and doorways, and, and so he made the decision that he was going to go ahead and send his wife and children away to their uncles who was located out in Elma just for the day because he had work to do. He had to ensure that their house was fully operational and that it was safe and he wasn't going to stop till it was done. And so after sending his wife and kids on their way, feeling a little bit relieved that now they're not in danger anymore, he decided to go ahead and call a close friend of his who would hopefully help him out in the situation. And so John decided to pick up the phone and call his friend Patrick, who at the time was actually one of the men that was currently under his supervision at their timber operation. And he would trust Patrick because he had proved to be a very good, hardworking man and was also a former state patrolman. And so after calling Patrick up and telling him, hey, 
can you kind of come by my house and stop by? I really need help with something that I really can't tell you about till you get here. And so Patrick, not really knowing what that is, decided to stop by and he knocks at the door. John opens up and asks him, are you ready for some hunting? And this is when John sat Patrick down and explained to him the entire series of events that had happened up until this very point. Now, Patrick was very confused, but obviously understanding just how serious and honest his boss, John, was. And he knew that he was morally obligated to help him do something about this and protect his family. So he goes out to his car, fetches his 38 for safety, and comes back to the house. Now, John then offered him a shotgun, takes his pistol, and a bolt action 30 odd six, and they began tracing the entire exterior of the home. Now, this is where both of the men would make another terrifying discovery, as if this entire episode so far hasn't been anything but that. Now, they find a large footprint in the mud right near the rear of the home, and it was clearly the largest footprint John and Patrick had ever seen. Its dimensions alone left both men completely awestruck. It was at least 18 inches in length, and next to it were four lines in the mud that clearly resembled finger marks, and these went on for probably about eight inches. It looked like something had drug four of its fingers in the mud, but it gets worse. They go outside to where Timothy's window is, and they're examining around the area, and John realizes that whatever this animal was didn't just pay his son Timothy a visit. No, no. It had actually bedded down in the grass outside his window as if it was waiting for the best opportune time to plot against Timothy in some way, maybe grab him. On the top of the window frame were streaks of mud and dirty fingerprints, and there also appeared to be quite a bit on the glass as well. And at this point, Patrick was really kind of having this, oh crap kind of moment, because he's realizing, oh my gosh, John, John's right. Now I can only imagine the hesitation that he was dealing with in that moment, because he's realizing, this isn't a bear that we're dealing with here. I don't know what it is, but it's not a bear. And now their next step was to actually go and investigate into the surrounding forest. But before doing that, John instructed Patrick that they actually first needed to go and take a visit to the pigs because John still had to feed them. Now, to understand the layout a little bit better, their pigsty was actually located 100 yards away toward the back end of their property, which was right behind an old barn. And so John and his family owned pigs, and these two pigs could often be heard shuffling around and grunting and squealing, even more so when they knew it was time to eat. And so John and Patrick, you know, they would make their way over there in conversation about what was happening and what this was and what they were going to do. And... John thought it was extremely strange that as they were getting closer, they didn't hear any noise at all. As they were coming around the corner to the pigsty, they realized it was completely empty. Now, John, who's already very nervous at this point, can't fathom how these two 40-pound pigs had escaped their pen. They both immediately go around. They're scouring the area. They're looking around and inside the barn, and there's no trace of them anywhere someone or something had to have clearly taken them. This made John very angry because now not only was his family being threatened, but he was being robbed of his way of life and potentially a food source. And as him and Patrick began to march into the woods, the same area where he had his experience the night before, he was actually able to show Patrick in broad daylight where it happened and what happened. And because the lighting was a lot better, Patrick could clearly see the depressions that were left in the floor of the forest that showed something really large had been tromping around. And so both men would continue to kind of just scour around the area, but they didn't find or see any signs of anything. They didn't hear anything. They pretty much just turned up empty handed. Now, at this point, John was feeling pretty defeated because he's really banking on capturing or killing this animal, but he had no idea where it had gone. And so after a while, both men got pretty hungry and decided it was time to go back to the house to get some lunch. Now, the rest of the day after that proved pretty uneventful, both of them scouring the property after lunch, but like before it, there's nothing, no sign of it anywhere. And so around the evening time, his family comes back home from being at his uncle's place, and John is completely defeated at this point by the lack of progress for the day and just tells his wife they tried, but they couldn't find anything. But John wasn't ready to give up yet. 
His plan was to sit on the porch all night waiting for this animal to show itself because he just knew it would. I mean, it was only a matter of time at this point. And so Patrick decided to say his goodbyes to John and got in the car and headed back home. And it was here that they had to make the proper accommodations for John to move forward with his plan. They all brought their bed as far away from the window as possible. And John declared to his family that everybody would sleep together in the master bedroom on this bed tonight. He entrusted his wife with a shotgun and gave her explicit instructions to open fire on anything that would move. However, she was to specifically ask for a name before firing so that way she would know if it was the cowman or her husband. And so as the evening grew later and later, John and his wife would tuck their kids into bed and John would go and sit out on the front porch fully armed and ready for action. And you could only imagine how nerve wracking this would be, right? You're already tense from the day. You know something's going on and you're just waiting. You're waiting and you're waiting. Well, the hours begin to tick by and the clock just began to go and go and go. And the moon would rise pretty high in the sky because it was pretty full this night. And so the forest was actually not quiet at all this evening. I mean, John could hear the frogs and the distance and the crickets and I mean, the woods around his property were very much alive. And John found himself getting pretty wound up more than he already was because he's already in a very paranoid state and he's trying to just, you know, look for any signs in the darkness of moving movement or anything out of the ordinary and so every tiny little movement or a shadow really just kind of gave him those those extra little bits of anxiety and at one point or another he just trying to calm his nerves down and you know he's standing up he's walking around the porch and he's just smoking you know kind of lost in thought and he just happens to face the direction of the barn and he's just kind of like losing himself in his own thoughts. And as he's sitting there holding a cigarette, you know, just puffing and the smoke's kind of coming out in front of him, he begins to look over in the direction of the barn. And the more he looks at the barn, he realizes that something is off, that the front door was left wide open. And because of where the moon was in the sky, it was actually spilling light partly inside of it. No, 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 this, this wasn't right. And so he kind of snaps back into reality for a moment and out of this trance and, and realizes that something's out of place here. And it's not so much just what he had seen, but now he notices that all the sounds around him of the night had gone quiet. It was then that he swore he saw movement in the barn and then John immediately sees something that would stand out to him. He sees these two little red glowing orbs coming from the entryway of the barn and he could see them kind of like blinking in and out and that they were hovering roughly eight or so feet off the ground because whoever or whatever it belonged to was looking in his direction and blinking, he believes. And so after a short amount of time, these blinking eyes just eventually went out completely. And as you can imagine, John is pretty spooked by this. His anxiety and adrenaline is very high, but he wasn't about to let this animal overtake his property. So he goes and he grabs his flashlight and he marches over there and, you know, he's kind of fumbling around with the flashlight in the moment, just trying to shine it out in the opening. Unfortunately, the beam of the light was too weak for it to really ever reveal anything in the barn. And so John just accepted that the only thing left to do was to actually go into the barn despite being completely terrified. And so John steps in the barn and he's looking around, looking for anything out of place and he doesn't notice anything out of the ordinary. He checked near some of the old supply crates and buckets and even by his old tractor and his pickup truck. And then he decides to set his flashlight down on a barrel and with his rifle, kind of just begins to sweep around the barn interior from left to right. And he's convinced that at any moment, the cowman would come charging out of the hay and attack him and grab him. And as tense as these moments were, they resulted in nothing. And John could not find anything that would stick out to him. And he became convinced that the barn was empty. And so John actually got ready to leave when he made a realization. He forgot to check the one spot, the hayloft. And now anxiety began to wash over him again, thinking that this is where the thing's probably hiding and that it's waiting for him to get to the top so it can just reach out and grab him and he would never be seen again. And so he just takes a deep breath, and so he just mounts the stairs and he works his way up and it's creaking and making all sorts of noise. And he, well, he gets to the top and something completely terrifying happens. This high shrieking shrill just blasts through the night air that actually 
takes John completely off guard. But the problem is that the shrill does not come from the hayloft. It didn't even come from the barn. It did not even come from the cowman himself. The sound came from his wife back at his house. Panic immediately sets in. John quickly turns around, tumbles his way down the ladder and down back to the barn and begins running back to his house, screaming his wife's name. And as he's running the 100 or so yards up to his house, he just keeps hearing more and more screaming. And as he's getting closer, he can he starts to hear shattering glass and shotgun blast. And at this point, he can only think that the worst is happening. And so he gets closer to his house and now he starts to hear another voice that was definitely not his wife's. He was hearing these strange screams that were loud and long and angry and agonized, but they were very clearly not human and they were moving away from the house. Now, John jumps up the porch, makes his way inside and into the bedroom where his entire family is cowering and crying and his children and wife were just, they were hysterical. They were traumatized. The window was completely shattered and broken. It looked as if something had tried to forcefully break in. John's wife is in complete state of fire flight and shock. And so she aims the shotgun right at John and he can see by the look in her eyes that she's not all there right now. And so he's waiting for her to open fire. He's got his hands up. He's like, honey, it's me, put the gun down. And so after a second or so, you know, she's she just screams and she just drops the gun and she just starts sobbing and crying. And so he runs over and rushes to his family and he's anxiously trying to comfort them and figure out what happened and what's going on. And they're just hysterical. They're a mess. They're traumatized. And his son, his youngest son, Timothy, is just screaming and sobbing at his mom, saying, Mommy, why did you shoot the cow man? Why? Now, John was eventually able to get everybody calmed down enough to leave them out into the living room. And then he quickly checked outside to make sure that the field was empty and there wasn't any trace of this cowman. And once he was sure it remained vacant for the time being, he made the decision enough was enough. You guys, all of us, we're gonna get in the car and we're gonna leave this property now before anyone else gets hurt. John realized that for him and his family to stick around any longer just meant bad news. And they were very unprepared. I mean, they're all in their pajamas. It's like past 10 at night. They're tired. They just want peace and quiet. They want to go to sleep. So they just kind of grabbed their essentials, which I imagine back in the 1960s probably wasn't a whole lot beyond just clothes. They hop in the car and they go to head back to Elma to John's brother's house. Now, on the way to Elma, John was able to finally find out what happened while he was out on the porch and decided to scour the barn. At one point or another, his wife had awoken to the sound of Timothy standing right by the window having a conversation with somebody. This person who he was conversing with was making these strange clicking, chirping sounds outside. Even more disturbing was the lighting. You see, where the moon was in the sky while this was happening, Timothy should have been completely illuminated by the moon, but instead he was obscured by this large shadow of something standing outside the window. And so in a whisper, she's begging Timothy to step away from the window, get away. And him being four years old is just laughing and being giddy and, you know, says, Mommy, listen, the cow man can make a sound like a bird. And she's getting even more freaked out, telling him, Timothy, get from the window. And as soon as she said those words, the noises outside the window changed and morphed from this kind of chirping into a strange nonsensical language, kind of like a gibberish sound or satirite shimmering, satirite shimmering, samurai chattering. During this time, her older son, John Jr. wakes up and you know he's kind of rubbing his eyes and like, what's going on? What's that noise? And as this happens, whatever was outside the window now turns its attention to John Jr. because it heard him ask that question and begins pounding on the house with its fist, causing the entire house to now shake violently. And so now John's wife and John Jr. are screaming. And somehow Timothy's trying to tell them, quiet guys, you're gonna scare him away. How he was not afraid, I have no idea. And so immediately, John's wife goes into mommy mode, grabs the shotgun, and abandons any attempts to try and remain quiet at this point, and demands that Timothy go back to bed now. And so she rushes toward the window, 
only to see this massive, dark, hairy form that actually has to lean down to peer into the window to look at them. And as she begins to aim right at this thing, she has to hesitate because she realizes if she were to take a shot now, it would hit her son. And so she reaches forward to try and grab her son, only to notice something even more horrifying that the being, animal, whatever it is outside the window was attempting to do the same thing. Bam! A large hairy hand bursts through the glass in an attempt to grab the boy. And so she smacks Timothy out of the way and out of reaction, bam, she fires a shot and it shoots directly above Timothy's head, completely destroys any remainder of the window. And well, she must have landed a direct hit because she hears the most horrific screaming that sounds agonized and inhuman and it starts running away and it's retreating back into the forest and it's howling all the way across the field and this is right where John enters the home. And as John learned these horrific details from his wife as she traumatically recounted them to him, he's realizing, oh my God. God, it may have been at the barn at one point, but it didn't stay there. The whole point in having him go out there was to get to his family. This was an elaborate ruse set on by the cowman to get to them. Now, eventually, the family would reach Elma, where they would stay until the following evening. And even though John's brother didn't believe a word of their story, he was more than happy to accommodate them in their time of need on the weekend. However, he could see that they were clearly traumatized and shaken up by something, so he actually offered his brother to come back with him and accompany him early Monday morning. And so the weekend comes and goes, and Monday morning rolls around where John and his brother get back to the property, and it's worse than you could ever imagine. The house was devastated. It was completely destroyed. It looked like a tornado had gone through it. They walked into the house and saw that the couch was flipped upside down. Their large 200 pound console TV was picked up and thrown across the room, laying in a spray of broken glass. And the kitchen was completely destroyed with the refrigerator knocked over, food everywhere. It was a disaster. The master bedroom wasn't spared either. Pillows were torn up, feathers everywhere. The mirror smashed. Everything that could be destroyed was destroyed. But. The doors to both of his son's rooms and the bathroom were left closed and unharmed. Now, I don't even know if there's a word or expression to possibly describe the emotions John must have been feeling in this moment. To go through the traumatic events of seeing his family suffer like they did, and now to come back to see their only livelihood now in shambles, there probably really wouldn't be much words to say, honestly. John's brother, who's now very disturbed by seeing all of this, he's telling his brother, you need to call the police now. And all John could really do was just kind of like mockingly respond to him and say, what, tell him a monster destroyed my house? Yeah, that's gonna go over well. I mean, John's kind of right. And so after looking over everything to see if there's really anything untouched, John and his brother drove to the timber mill located in Aberdeen, where John worked as the foreman. Now, as soon as John makes it onto the job site, he's several hours late, mind you, John's boss, who ran the entire operation, immediately acknowledged that there was something very off with John. John was a very trustworthy, no-nonsense kind of man, extremely hard worker. I mean, there is a reason that his boss entrusted him to be the foreman. And so it was very unlike him and out of his character to show up several hours later, sleep deprived, unprepared for the day, and clearly traumatized after the weekend's events. And so John's boss thought very highly of him. And so instead of doing what a lot of normal bosses would do and pull you to the side and just, you know, he actually pulls John into his office, sits him down and starts asking him what happened. This is like, what's going on with you, John? And so John just starts telling him exactly what happened. And I wanna say right here that the leniency that John's boss was affording him was pretty much unheard of unless they had some sort of close relationship. John's boss ran several large successful timber operations and he had entrusted John with great responsibility to not only manage the employees, but also the equipment. This was a very large salvage operation that was going to supply his roofing product mill in Aberdeen. And so he wouldn't just stick 
anybody there as the foreman. John was someone who he greatly trusted. And so in John's boss's office, he begins to explain to his boss that something's destroyed their house this weekend. Now, at first, his boss thought he said someone and not something. And so he's asking, do you know who it was? Have you called the police? Like, what's going on? And all John could say was, you don't understand. This wasn't a person. He didn't know who or what it was, but it completely trashed the house. And he would begin to tell him more details about the horrific weekend he had and that it resulted in the family going to stay with his brother and Elma for a little while until they can try and figure out their life from here. And so after John had finished telling his boss everything that had happened, he expressed to him that, hey, my brother's still out in the car waiting for me. We got to go get to Elma. I'm clearly in no condition to work at the moment. And so his boss actually wanted to go and see the damage for himself. I mean, his boss was kind of thinking that maybe the foreman he hired now had completely lost it. There had to have been some sort of sense of rationality here somewhere, right? And so the two men get up, they go back to John's brother's car, and they drive back to his house, so that way his boss can see the complete carnage that had taken place. And they would look inside the house as well as outside and survey everything. John's boss got a chance to see firsthand the footprints and the fingerprints and the mud they had discovered on Saturday. And obviously his boss was completely taken aback by the sheer volume of destruction. I mean, entering the house alone, he saw the carnage firsthand and it was here that he would make an additional discovery. Up on the ceiling were these large cracks that would imply that something had actually tried to stand up in the house only for it to hit its head with incredible force. Now it was clear that at this point, the house was damaged beyond repair. And even if there was any hope in repair, I mean, there's no way an insurance company would pay for this. We all know insurance companies have been scumbags about paying for stuff or trying to get out of paying for things. They wouldn't help this poor man out, absolutely not. And even if they would have, at this point, his family is so traumatized, there's no way that they would continue to stay here. And so John's boss wasn't sure what to make of John's story, but clearly something out of the ordinary had taken place that had now resulted in his family's homelessness. The only thing that John's boss could conclude is that he believed John was firmly telling the truth. The damage that had been done to the home would have been impossible to have been done by a human being. Not to mention just how shaken up and traumatized John was from the events. If this was some sort of elaborate hoax or outlandish tale in an attempt to seek fame and fortune, John made no efforts at all to capitalize on it. He wanted nothing more to do with the property, and he told his boss he wanted to stay far away from it as absolutely possible for the rest of his life. And because John's boss thought so highly of him, he actually really wanted to help out the family. And so he extended the invitation to put his family up in a house that he owned in Aberdeen, and he would even loan them money so that way they could actually replace some of the belongings they had. Now, as time would go on, because remember, this was the 1960s, the pre-internet era, John's boss would eventually lose contact with John. And so as the years would go by, John's boss would go on to have a son, Shannon. Now, Shannon actually grew up working in his father's timber business, which, by the way, was very successful all up and down the coast of the Pacific Northwest. And it was during the 1960s and later on that Mr. Baker, John's boss, owned several shake and shingle mills and even held a dozen different patents to streamline the process. I mean, this was a very successful businessman. However, Mr. Baker withheld John's story for all these years until his son Shannon would eventually press him enough and out of desperation beg his dad to tell the story and, well, he would eventually tell Shannon the story. And so the only reason we even know about this story that I've shared with you all is because Shannon D. Baker is the one who shared this online with all of us. Now, as far as the strange being that terrorized John's family, destroyed his property, and tried to pull his son out the window, well, that remains a mystery. And because you guys made it this far into the episode, I want you to all comment down below, Cowman. So that way I know who made it to the end of the episode and who didn't. And if you guys want more content just like this, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button for more. As always, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next episode.